This is going to be Revelation chapter 4. And we're going to talk about what's behind the door in heaven. And here in Revelation chapter 4, the Apostle John is caught up to heaven. And he says, a door was opened in heaven. And then he describes to us some things that are behind the door. You have to have the door to get through this door. And the door is described in John chapter 10 and verse 7. It says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So Jesus Christ is the door. And to get in the door of heaven, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the door. So Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So number one, behind this door you have a voice. And this is the voice of God. Psalms 29 describes the voice of God. If you turn to Psalms 29 and look at verses 3 through 8, it says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon, the wa upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. God has a powerful voice. Imagine being Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden after they ate the fruit. And they heard the voice of the Lord and they hid from the voice. Imagine being at the great white throne and hearing Jesus Christ say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What a scary voice it would be to hear that phrase come out of his mouth. And here in Revelation 4.1, John says the voice was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. So God's voice sounds like a trumpet. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, at the rapture of the church, the Lord descends from heaven with a shout and the trump of God. In 1 Corinthians 15.52, at the sound of the last trump, we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So I can see Revelation 4.1 as a picture of the rapture of the church. Not the actual rapture, but a picture. I also noticed that the voice says the phrase, the voice says the phrase, come up hither. And this is most likely what Jesus Christ will shout when he comes at the rapture. Born again believers will hear God's voice and the lost world will hear thunder. John twelve twenty eight through 29 says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. So to the lost world, the voice of God sounds like thunder. To you, you'll probably hear, come up hither. I also notice that there are three times that the Bible says the phrase, come up hither. Once in Proverbs 25, 7, it says, For better it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Revelation 4, 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Revelation eleven twelve, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And if you look at these come up hithers, you'll see Revelation 4, 1 would match the pre-trib rapture. Revelation eleven twelve would match the post-trib rapture. And in Revelation 12, it's Moses and Elijah that are getting caught up, the two witnesses. And it says, Come up hither. And in, so in Proverbs 27, 1, it's most likely referring to the Old Testament saints being taken up when Jesus Christ led captivity captive. So you have a come up hither that will match each 
of the three raptures. And Revelation 4.1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Notice the word hereafter. This book is amazing. The things in this book haven't even taken place yet. And you are literally reading the future. Every time you pick up the book, it has so much prophecy in it that you are basically getting in a time machine and going into the future. But not only is there a voice behind the door, there is also a throne. Revelation 4.2 And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And notice that John is in the Spirit. When it says that phrase, it seems that John is being picked up and transported somewhere else. If you look at Revelation 17.3, you're going to see that same phrase. And it says, So he carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And then again in Revelation 21.10, it says, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And then earlier in Revelation, it, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So he was carried to the day of the Lord. Comparing Scripture with Scripture, it seems when John is in the Spirit, he is being carried somewhere else. In the Spirit basically means not in the body, not in the Spirit as in having a shouting spell at a good revival meeting. Many times people say, I got in the Spirit at church. But I believe if you compare Scripture with Scripture, that when John says in the Spirit, he's being carried somewhere else. But there is a throne behind this door. And Psalms 93, 2 says, Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Can you imagine getting to look at God's throne? People love to go and look at material items that are antique or old. And some things that have a lot of age are worth a lot of money. God's throne is way older than any statues in a museum or any furniture in your grandmother's house or in some store some an antique store john got to see the throne along with other men such as isaiah and ezekiel and john paul was caught up to heaven and he saw things that he couldn't even come down and tell people about and daniel 7 9 says i beheld to the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So his throne is like a fiery flame. Jesus Christ is the Ancient of Days, and I'm excited about seeing him sit on his throne. In Revelation 5-7, the very next chapter, it talks about the Lamb taking the book out of the hand of him that sat on the throne. So it seems that the Father and the Son sit in the same throne. And God the Father would be the soul. Jesus Christ is the body. And as a young kid, I remember imagining Jesus Christ sitting in his own throne on the right hand of the Father. And since I am finite, I can't wrap my head around the Godhead, Godhead or the Trinity completely. I don't understand a lot of things about it. But I know the Bible teaches that God the Father the Son, and the Holy Ghost is one God. And this God can manifest Himself in different places at once. And I really don't like to get into it too much because it's over my head and I know my limits. But verse 3 of Revelation chapter 4 gives some descriptions of who the one is who is sitting on the throne. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. A jasper is gold. A sardine is red. And emerald is green. So you have Christmas colors around the throne. And I thought that was interesting. 
when Satan was created as Lucifer, a beautiful creature, he had Jasper as his covering. And New Jerusalem will also have Jasper. So God likes to add Jasper to his creation. And the one sitting on the throne was to look upon like a sardine stone. So Jesus Christ is referred to as a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. He is our rock. And evolutionists believe we came from a rock. We did, but that rock was Christ. And for His pleasure, we are and we're created. We didn't come about by evolution. Notice that the rainbow is really God's symbol. Because there's a rainbow round about the throne. But yet Satan stole it, stole this symbol and perverted it. Literally. Also remember that movie Wizard of Oz? They obviously got ideas from the book of Revelation. Remember they had the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow? This rainbow in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 3 is in sight like unto an emerald. And of course the Wizard of Oz has the emerald city. The throne has 24 seats around it. Revelation 4.4 4, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And these are some very blessed individuals who are getting to sit in these 24 seats. I have no idea who the 24 elders are. I've heard that it is 24 of the best saints. I've heard it represents the body of Christ. I've heard that it represents the 12 disciples. And I don't really have any idea that convinces me of who they are. Maybe you do, but I have no idea. And notice that these 24 elders have white raiment. So their clothes show their righteousness. And their garments show how they are on the inside. And this is true for people today many times. Many times you can tell a lot about a person by what they have on. And we shouldn't mistreat people because of their clothes. But many times a person who listens to wicked music will dress like wicked rock and roll singers or rappers. If they listen to emo music, they will dress in all black and pierce their body. And even in the time of Jacob's trouble, their spiritual condition can also be seen in their clothes. Because Jude talks about hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Levi Leviticus talks about leprosy getting into a man's garments. And when a man takes the mark of the beast, he gets a noisome and grievous sore. And this seems to be like leprosy and will most likely get in his clothes. So in that sense, you can tell a man's spiritual condition by what he has on. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, the rich men are going to have on nice clothes. And you're going to have all the righteous people that's not got on nice clothes. And the book of James talks about not having respect to people wearing the gay clothing. And these people in the time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to be rich. They're going to think they have need of nothing. They're going to look down on God's people. But we shouldn't judge people just by w what they wear. But these 24 elders clothed in white raiment, their clothes actually do show their righteousness. And Revelation 4.4 4 says these elders also have on their he heads crowns of gold. Crowns are given out at the judgment seat of Christ. And this could mean the judgment seat of Christ has already taken place. Next we see some descriptions about some things that go on around this throne. Revelation 4, 5 says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So in Revelation 4, 1, we have a good picture of the rapture. It talks about crowns, showing the timeline, the rapture takes place. Then we'll go to the judgment seat of Christ. And now we're going to look at just more things around the throne. Lightnings, thunderings, and voices. And seven lamps of fire burning. And notice you see that these lightnings, thunderings, and voices. All three of these things scare people in this world. If you ever watched horror movies as a lost person. Or even saved people still watch horror movies. Which isn't good. Then you remember scenes with thunder and lightning. And these things make a scary setting in a movie. Also... 
You always hear voices and whispers in the background that sound scary. How many times do horror movies use little whispering voices to make a creepy setting for the movie? Or some crazy person hears voices. So if a lost man went to heaven, he would be scared just like he's going to be scared in hell. But people in heaven are saved and they know God and they know the things of God. Revelation 4, 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So what are these seven spirits of God before the throne? Isaiah 11, 2. Isaiah 11, 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So there's the seven spirits there in Isaiah 11, 2. The seven spirits before the throne are the Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. So behind the door... We have already seen a voice, a throne, and now we're going to see a sea of glass. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6 says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. Saints will actually stand on this sea of glass with harps in their hand. Revelation 15, 2, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. This sea of glass is a body of water over your head, and the face of it is frozen. Job 38.30 The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. In the Bible, when it's talking about the deep, it's referring to that sea of glass up above your head. And I've been called a hippie or crazy for teaching that there's a body of water up above the second heaven. And that's understandable because if you don't read the Bible, then, then that does sound crazy. But the Bible isn't hard to understand. It's hard for people to believe. And many times when we hear something we have never heard, it's only natural for our flesh to try and reject it without having even looked into it or studied it. And... One of the things I've learned in my Christian life is not to be so quick to call someone crazy, but for scriptural proof that there are waters above the heavens, I'll give you a few verses. Psalms 148, 4 says, Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Ezekiel seems to have a good description of the sea of glass. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 22 through 26, it says, And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. So, it's talking about there the sea of glass that's over their head. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Every one had two which covered on this side, and every one had two which covered on that side their bodies. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings, and their voice, and there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of the throne. So there you have the throne of God that's sitting on the sea of glass. And it says, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. So the throne of God in the firmament, the throne of God is on the firmament, and this is obviously talking about God's throne on the sea of glass as in Revelation chapter 4. And then in verse 27 of Ezekiel chapter 1, and it says, And I saw the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. You remember the sea of glass in Revelation 15 is mingled with fire. And so behind the door, we see a voice, a throne, and a sea of glass. And next we see seraphim. Revelation 4, 6 says, 
And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast, beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sit on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. So I believe these beasts are seraphim instead of the cherubim. And I know most believe it is cherubim, and I wouldn't want to argue about it, but I just believe it is seraphim because in Isaiah 6, 2, the seraphim have six wings, just like these beasts here in Revelation chapter 4. And the cherubim are said to have four wings in Ezekiel chapter 1. If you look at Isaiah 6, 2, it says, And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And they also say, Holy, holy, holy in Isaiah 6, just like they do here in Revelation chapter 4. Isaiah 6, 3, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And now back to Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. It says, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sit on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I believe this is one of the reasons why Jesus Christ has many crowns on his head when he comes back. Revelation 19:12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name, a name written that no man knew but he himself. And maybe all the crowns will form a giant crown. Who knows, maybe it's a bunch of crowns. And it will be exciting to see. And then Revelation 4.11 is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Many times people ask, what is the meaning of life? Or why was I ever even born? And these questions can all be summed up in one answer. The will of God is for you to be saved and give glory to Him. God created everything for His pleasure. He wants everyone to be saved and serve Him because He is the only one worthy to receive glory and honor and power. If you say that is selfish, then you're deceived by the devil. Notice the verse also said He created all things. Everything is rightfully His, and it's only because of His mercy that you're not being put in hell. If He hadn't created man, then you wouldn't even be here. So you need to show Him respect. You need to believe the gospel, for one. If you're not saved, then you're going to go to hell if you die in that condition. You're going to die in your sins and you're going to wake up in torment in a flame of fire. In Luke chapter 16, the rich man opened up his eyes in hell. It says he lifted up his eyes being in torments. And hell is a horrible place where there's weeping and there's wailing and there's gnashing of teeth. But the Bible gives us a clear plan of salvation. First off, you need to know why you need a Savior, and that's because you are a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. It says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So what's the gospel? Is that Jesus died. Number one, He died for you, and He died for your sins. He was buried, and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The reason He had to die was because you're a sinner. That's a part of the gospel. There's a lot of people that won't tell you you're a sinner. They're afraid to tell you that. And when they do that, they're taking away part of the gospel because it says Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you stay in those sins, then you're going to go to hell. If you want to be saved, then you need to put your trust in that gospel. Don't put your trust in doing good things. Don't put your trust in living a good life. 
The Bible says in Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And there's a difference between believing in Jesus Christ, as in believing he existed in history and that he was a good person. What you need to do is believe on Jesus Christ, meaning you're going to put your trust on what he did on the cross and his payment for sin, and let that payment for sin be what gets you to heaven. You're going to rely on that instead of relying on yourself. You're going to realize that you're no good and you're in your sin and staying in your sins, you're not going to get to heaven. And once you turn from your own self-righteousness and put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and rely on what he did and his finished work on the cross, then you can be saved and go to heaven. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you want to be saved, come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and put all your trust on what he did for you on the cross.